Welcome to the Virtual Space TV Show. This time with the following stories. ATV, Eduardo Amaldi arrives at the International Space Station. Love and Mercy song, back at the ISS. SpaceX Dragon now set to fly to the ISS. Billions and billions of Earth-sized planets. And as usual, at the end I will update you on the latest activities concerning the space weather. Please note, that the complete show has been generated by software and, consequently, all the voices are synthetic. Now over to you, Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda Bush. On March 23rd, an Ariane 5 rocket blasted off from the European spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the European Space Agency's Automated Transfer Vehicle, or ATV. Five days later, the 20-ton vehicle caught up with the International Space Station and successfully docked with it. The ATV carries up to three tons of dry cargo and water for supplying the station also including a completely new design space toilet. The old one caused some emergency situations on board of the ISS, by working more like a zero-gravity human waste distribution system. By the way, the toilet design team at Warner Space Enterprises, led by this man, Howard Wolowitz, has been identified to be responsible for some very unpleasant recent weeks in orbit. But now back to our story. The ATV also holds extra fuel that it will use to boost the station to a higher orbit. This is the third ATV and it is christened Eduardo Amaldi, after the famous Italian physicist. The vehicle will remain attached to the ISS until August, when it will undock from the station after being packed with bags of garbage. It will then deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere. European space officials are discussing the development of a space tug, based on the ATV that could be used for tasks such as space debris retrieval and deep space missions when combined with the crew module. The Dutch rock band Love and Mercy celebrated the return of the ATV to the station with a special song, Back at the ISS, to the tune of the Beatles song Back in the USSR. Astronaut and ISS crew member Andre Coopers is Dutch, and so the band wanted to give him a special hello. Take a listen to a part of their musical treat. NASA hopes soon to resume sending cargo to the ISS, which it has not done since the end of the space shuttle flights. The agency's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program, or COTS as it is called, contracted with the firm SpaceX and Orbital Sciences, each to develop and operate a rocket and spacecraft for delivery of supplies to the station. In December of 2010, SpaceX successfully launched a Dragon spacecraft into orbit. After two orbits of the Earth, 
the Dragon capsule re-entered the atmosphere and landed by parachute in the ocean near Southern California, where it was successfully recovered. Such a feat had only been accomplished previously by the government space programs in Russia, USA and China. Now SpaceX must take the next crucial step and demonstrate that its Dragon spacecraft can rendezvous with the ISS and dock with the station. After a number of delays due primarily to software problems, a launch is set for April 30th. The Falcon 9 will lift off from Cape Canaveral with a Dragon capsule containing a half ton of cargo. Over the course of three days, the Dragon will gradually approach the ISS and carry out a series of maneuvers to prove that it can safely rendezvous with the station. Once it gets close, a robotic arm will reach out from the station and attach to the Dragon and bring it in for docking. It will be quite an historic event for NASA and private space flight when the station crew members open the hatch to the Dragon. SpaceX hopes also to win a contract to launch crews to the station in Dragon capsules. A successful cargo delivery mission will be a big step in that direction. Orbital Sciences expects to launch its Antares rocket this summer. Later in the year they will then launch their Cygnus cargo spacecraft on the Antares for a test delivery run to the station. So, by 2013 there should be two U.S. private companies routinely delivering cargo to the ISS. We reported back in December that the Kepler orbiting telescope had detected a planet just over twice the size of Earth in an orbit in the so-called habitable zone around its star. The habitable zone is where temperatures on the planet's surface would allow for liquid water if the atmosphere is similar to that of Earth in pressure and composition. Kepler does not see a planet directly, but instead detects the decrease in light from its star as the planet passes between us and the star. Another technique for detecting exoplanets is to observe the changes in frequency of a star's light as a planet pulls the star towards and away from Earth as it moves around its orbit. This Doppler shift technique has been used by the European Southern Observatory to look for exoplanets around red dwarf stars. Red dwarfs are cooler than the Sun but constitute nearly 80% of the stars in the Milky Way. And though cooler, they still have a habitable zone of orbits, just closer in than for our Sun. A survey of a sample of red dwarf stars by the ESO over the past several years detected nine super-Earths, which are planets with masses between 1 and 10 times that of Earth. Two of these super-Earths were inside the habitable zones of their stars. Extrapolating from this sample means that there are many billions of Earth-sized planets in the Milky Way in habitable zones of red dwarfs. Furthermore, in Earth's neighborhood out to 30 light-years, there should be around 100 Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones of red dwarfs. Currently these exoplanet detection techniques are not very sensitive to finding Earth-sized planets. However, it is already clear that Earth-sized exoplanets in habitable zones are common in the Milky Way. This greatly improves the chances that life and civilizations have arisen out there. Let's now hear from James C. Burke about what has been happening in space weather. James? Thanks, Amanda. There was a lot happening in and around the sun recently. For example, early in March a huge sunspot was observed in the northern hemisphere of the sun that emitted large flares throughout the month. For example, on March 7 it erupted in a major flare that sent out a wave of protons that impacted the Earth a day later. And on March 9, it sent out another huge flare towards Earth. The aurora were particularly beautiful from the solar activity during the month. Spring is a good time for aurora observing. 
As the sun's activity rises towards the maximum in the solar cycle, more spectacular nightly shows are expected in the coming year. Another interesting event happened recently when the comet named Swan dove into the sun as seen in the sequence of images from the Soho spacecraft. The coronal mass ejection seen is not due to the comet, but just a coincidental sunspot eruption. Space weather watching is quite an entertaining job these days. Back to you, Amanda. I hope you enjoyed this show, and that we will see you again for the next broadcast in early May. In the meantime, you can get the latest space news on www.hobbaspace.com. Your comments are welcome. Either on YouTube or by mail at amandabush at binary-space.com. See you.